Hello, this is Adam with Dream Made Productions. This video is made possible by the very kind donations of viewers like you. Thank you. If you are in a position to help this channel improve quality and grow, please visit my Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash dreammadeproductions, linked below. It is the 31st century, and mankind is once again at war. The battlefields of the future are dominated by huge robotic war machines known as battle mechs. Hello, and welcome back to The Arsenal, a series where we look at the weapons, equipment, and technology of the Battletech universe. We continue our enlightening look at some energy-based weapons. Today, we cover another attempt to improve the time-tested laser system, pulse lasers. Weaponized light has always been a fickle thing when it comes to warfare. Despite my best attempts, I have already brought up ancient weapons that supposedly turned simple sun rays deadly. I won't go back over the Syracuse Death Ray aka Archimedes Mirror, but I will say the idea is nothing new. While useful in pre-spaceflight times as a targeting assist or in munitions guidance, the ability to turn light into an effective and reliable weapon was a long time coming. Even once the Western Alliance introduced the first real laser weapons, an age-old debate started that, more or less, continues to this day. Are lasers worth it? After all, almost any job a laser can do, there is normally a cheaper or simpler weapon out there. Good old slug-throwing combat rifles can be just as effective as their laser-powered cousins in most circumstances and at a fraction of the price and manufacturing complexity. You will still find today that this argument is still present. Some argue that the heat buildup and manufacturing difficulties should limit the laser system when compared to the simplicity of things like autocannons. Our friends over in the Federated Suns make their feelings on this topic very clear. On the other hand, you have guys that look at the thousands of pounds of high explosive waiting to cook off in their machine and object to the prior argument. Both are pretty much pointless because these weapon systems have been around so long that their success proves their effectiveness. In the late 2500s, the Terran hegemony was dealing with the fallout of commonly available laser weapon systems. Unlike the Great Houses, the hegemony was somewhat restricted in its physical size, and that could equal lower manufacturing output, as well as overall smaller army sizes. To remain on top, the hegemony had always relied on the head start it enjoyed in advanced weapons. But in these days, that advantage had long since slipped away. While still producing the highest of quality, each of the great houses was more than capable of self-producing weapon systems on par with the hegemony standard. Advanced weapon systems were needed to keep the hegemony one step above the competition and lasers were a prime candidate for improvement. One idea was to increase their range, a somewhat daunting task we have already looked at. However, there was a problem that reduced the effectiveness of lasers, and solving that problem was a lot easier. You see, a laser works by melting its target. Not only complicated, but has some unintended side effects. As the beam hits the poor unlucky bastard you are shooting it at, it lets go with drills into the target. 
Most of the affected armor is liquefied, but a small amount is fully vaporized. Sounds even better, right? I mean, melted is good, but vaporized is even better? Not really. The vaporized slab does not cease to exist. It's still there, just as a gas and tiny particles, now flowing around in the air. In the same air our laser is still traveling through. This means energy is wasted further heating the vaporized armor particles and refracting off it. Trapped in our beam it has nowhere to go. While not crippling by any means, it does reduce the effectiveness of our laser. The solution was simple. Turn off the beam just long enough to let the tiny cloud clear, then turn the beam back on. We are talking about fractions of a second here. Quickly turning on and off the laser proved much easier than increasing its range, but some issues were found along the way. First, firing the laser in a single burst is far more energy efficient than rapidly powering down, then back up again. This means higher heat draw. Second, range drops off some. The flashing can't carry the photons as far as a solid bolt. Finally, well, as anyone who has kids knows, sooner or later the little buggers discover the light switch and decide to create their own light show. Admit it, we all did it and did not understand why we were told to knock it off. Until we grew up and realized that turning something rapidly on and off greatly increases wear and tear. On the upside, allowing the vaporized armor to clear did increase the weapon's damage and its quick fire assisted in scoring hits. Plus, the basic theory behind pulse lasers worked no matter what kind of laser it was. No special considerations for the gamma-based large laser versus the free electron system behind the medium and small laser. So, research for the different laser classes could be carried out in reducing research time and costs. Now, very early examples of such weapons ran hotter and tended to burn out very quickly, so heavier and more advanced materials were needed to keep the weapon useful in battlefield conditions. The hegemony would introduce their new, <laughs> as an associate of mine likes to call them, disco death lasers to the inner sphere in 2609, releasing a version of all three laser classes within weeks of each other beating out the unveiling of the ER large laser by a decade. The head start was useful as, unlike the ER laser, there was no kit that could be issued to turn standard lasers into pulses. Nope, pulse lasers had to be designed and built from the ground up to be pulse lasers. But my oh my, what a difference they can make. The large pulse laser is, well, the largest of the pulse lasers. It tends to cycle the slowest, but also has the longest range. At seven tons, its considerably sturdier components make it heavier than the standard or ER large laser. Still, at only two criticals, it easily fits right into a large laser weapons bay. Firing cycle, or burst, or pulse blast, whatever you want to call it, generates a somewhat staggering 10 heat, but nets you 9 damage. Like all of its type, connecting with the target is much easier than a standard laser bolt, but at the cost of range, an almost 30% reduction. The large pulse laser is, well, deadly accurate is not strong enough. Let's go with godly accurate out to 3, becoming well, pretty damned accurate out to 7, and combat ineffective past 10. The medium laser similarly got its own pulse laser variant. At 2 tons, the weapon is almost twice as heavy, but still takes up one critical. Firing it will heat up 4 heat 
instead of the normal three, but will damage the enemy about six rather than the normal five. As with all pulse lasers, the weapon is easy to hit with, but sees its optimal range reduced to just two, while still being very effective out to four, but falling off completely past six. A considerable drop off but one that can be worth it depending on the situation. The small pulse laser is something of an oddity in the group. Its weight, like the medium laser, doubled to a full ton, but retained its small footprint of one critical. Firing a small laser will generate two heat, a full extra, but does not enjoy any increase in its damage potential. The small laser just did not vaporize enough armor to see it be that much of a change, keeping its three, but its range is unaffected, retaining its simple one, two, and three range brackets. The small laser does cycle the fastest of all pulse lasers, making it far more effective against infantry, about as effective as a machine gun, especially at scoring deadly hits. Pulse lasers would go on to become very popular weapons in the armies of the SLDF, and of course, slowly make their way into house military units. By the time of the Great War, both sides enjoyed a stockpile of pulse lasers, even if they did not completely replace the time-tested standard. Like so much pulse technology did not mix well with the apocalypse of the secession wars. The more advanced components needed to keep the things useful quickly dried up. Hell, we are in many ways fortunate enough to have kept the standard laser systems by some estimates. Still, legends don't go away. Stories of Laser machine guns would be passed down, and attempts to recreate the technology were tried. 3039 would see their limited return, followed quickly by full production after the discovery of the Helm Memory Core. But, at least as the story goes, there were other attempts to improve baseline laser technology particularly the concept of a pulse laser during those dark days. But, well, that's a story for another time. In the time since their reintroduction, pulse lasers have been tinkered with to further improve their effectiveness. The clans, of course, had centuries to do said tinkering, leading to their versions which are, of course, lighter, smaller, longer range, and more damage because, as I've mentioned so many times, life is unfair. Despite this, the before-mentioned tinkering by Intersphere designers have yielded all kinds of results. The Federated Commonwealth's X-Pulse lasers, an attempt to match the clan's range advantage. The Variable Speed Pulse laser, of the word of Blake at Free Worlds League, a way to increase damage and ease of use at close range at the further expense of longer ranges. The laser anti-missile system, a safer and ammo-friendly alternative to traditional AMS systems, when the thing works. RISC laser modules, trying to make the standard lasers and ER lasers into pulse lasers, with varying degrees of success. And most recently, re-engineered lasers, because why not mix inner sphere and clan technology? What could possibly go wrong? We of course will take a look at each and every one of these fancy systems when the time is right. But what do you think about pulse lasers? Is their accuracy and extra damage worth the downsides? What about lasers in general? Super weapons from the future? Or over and engineered and overly expensive when compared to projectile weapons? Let me know below. And as always, I hope you enjoy the battle reps that are to come.
Hello, this is Adam with Dream Made Productions. Thank you for watching my content. It really means a lot that you have given me the chance to entertain you. If you would like to support the channel, please visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash dreammadeproductions, linked below. Also below is a link for PayPal, or links if you would like to send crypto, if that's more your thing. Please know any amount that you give will be cherished and used to upgrade equipment and improve the channel. You can also help the channel by subscribing, turning on notifications, liking, commenting, and sharing my channel with anyone you think might be interested. Thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoy the battle reps that are to come.